It's the most impressive economic success story of our time, but today that success looks shakier than ever. In the last 20 years, China climbed the world's economic ranks. It managed the fastest sustained growth of any major economy ever recorded. Now its size remains second only to that of the United States. China's rapid rise propelled predictions that it will soon become the world's largest economy. Now the country's outlook is clouded. For the first time in two decades, China's economic output will fall behind that of the rest of Asia. A growth slowdown is prompting many experts to reconsider when China could overtake the US and if it ever will. In this episode, we will look at the issues underlying China's cooling economy. The lifting of COVID does not necessarily change or solve China's economic structural problems. It's hard to maintain dynamic growth when your labor force is shrinking. If you're trying to export to the rest of the world and domestic demand remains very weak, uh, I really think that puts a limit to your growth fundamentally. We will assess the international factors threatening growth. The external environment in China is really as bad as anybody could remember it since the era of Mao Zedong. And we will be asking, can China still become the world's largest economy? And China is still the world's largest exporter, still the world, world's lar largest manufacturing center, um, and the domestic market is huge. So if China does not make it, that's the point, to overcome or, or, or surpass the US, before 2027 20, or 8, it will never do. That's all coming up on Business Beyond. In 2010, China's GDP growth stood at an impressive 10.6%. Since then, the pace of expansion has slowed down. According to IMF forecasts, its GDP growth will continue a trend of decline even after the pandemic. In the coming years, it expects growth to hover below 5%, although some forecasts are slightly more optimistic. One big factor affecting the pace of economic growth is the zero COVID policy that dominated life in China for the past three years. While most countries around the world began winding down their pandemic measures in 2022, China tightened its grip. At the moment, the Chinese economy, the, the growing rate, the growth rate is not um, very high. But there are several reasons behind it. The most biggest, re the biggest reason is the pandemic. Draconian measures to contain the virus sapped domestic consumption, crippled small businesses, and kept China's factories closed. They also eventually prompted the most widespread anti-government protests in decades. In December 2022, the Chinese government rolled back the controversial policy, releasing its grip on the economy. But many analysts believe that the end of zero COVID in China won't signal the revival of economic growth as we know it. The lifting of COVID does not necessarily change or solve China's economic structural problems. To look beyond the short-term issues and understand the underlying factors stunting economic growth in China, it's worth revisiting how its economy boomed in the first place. Half a century ago, China was reeling from 10 years of political and social chaos. The so-called Cultural Revolution under Mao Zedong aimed to rid the country of any vestiges of capitalism. But everything changed with the death of Mao Zedong and the eventual rise of Deng Xiaoping. In the 80s, Deng Xiaoping uh, and his uh, colleagues decided to send China towards a uh, different uh, route compared to communist, socialist um, period. China was keen to liberalize, to open up, to embrace the global market. The country transformed. Cities, factories and universities started filling up. Manufacturing, technology and entrepreneurship exploded. China's middle class was thriving. Deng Xiaoping's reforms woke up a dormant economic superpower you put all your children into primary school and secondary school. You move labor from low productivity agriculture into higher productivity manufacturing in urban areas. Um, and you do these kinds of things. And if you 
if you're really good at doing them and you're very effective at doing them, obviously the rewards are huge, and they, and they were in China's case. China's fundamental reforms reconciled its economy with global trading rules and swung open the door to the World Trade Organization in 2001. China went through an extremely um, high speed of growth after China joined the WTO. During the six years following China's accession, its annual GDP growth averaged an eye-watering 12%. Cheap labor and its integration into the world economy fueled China's rise. It became the biggest global exporter. The economy went up really fast until the point 2008, the global financial crisis happened. China was not hit immediately, but it was indirectly affected because the US market and the European market was heavily influenced. Export orders from Europe and the US dried up during the financial crisis. So China began pumping more money into its own economy to create jobs. That paved the way for one of the biggest threats the Chinese economy is facing today. Debt. Yeah, so from 2010 or 2009 until about 2020, until COVID, um, China went on this huge debt uh, jamboree um, and, um, and really accumulated more debt than anybody could have predicted or would have expected. The Chinese government shielded its economy with bricks and mortar, and it worked. China's investment boom maintained economic growth at close to 10%, even after the crisis. But propping up the economy with infrastructure investments meant the government had to keep on building. Eventually, you're going to have enough harbors, roads, uh, airports. China's super speed railway system illustrates its inefficient spending spree. The country boasts the world's longest high speed rail network. But despite excess capacity and mounting financial losses, the network keeps growing, even in less populated locations where there isn't much demand. Now, maintenance costs and interest payments have overtaken the railway's income. They've overbuilt local infrastructure. So on the one hand, if you travel around China, it's very impressive that they have all these expressways, high-speed rail, airports, but a lot of them are severely underutilized. And some of it, frankly, are white elephants that are not generating a lot of additional economic activity. From 2008 to 2021, China's debt more than doubled from 140 to 286 percent of GDP. Today, China's total debt is three times the size of its economy. Much of that debt didn't end up on Beijing's balance sheet, but on that of local governments. To pay for what Beijing ordered, they relied on another debt-ridden sector in the Chinese economy, real estate. In order to raise money for Beijing's plans, local governments started selling publicly owned land to real estate developers. The developers rushed to buy what was on offer, inflating a giant housing bubble. China had a property boom over a couple of decades, which was, uh, you know, massive. It fueled a lot of optimism. It fueled a lot of um, really, really bad risk taking. Um, Property developers got into too much debt. Um, households started on taking a lot of mortgage debt. Um, it's a typical story. Especially in smaller Chinese cities, housing construction started outstripping demand, giving rise to China's so-called ghost cities. Today, China has enough unoccupied apartments to house the population of France. With a mountain of real estate debt at risk of collapse, the government tightened property restrictions. But it all began to um, start to go wrong in about 2021. Uh, the government introduced regulations um, that tried to limit uh, the liabilities and constrain the balance sheets of property developers. And um, what we got eventually was a, a bust in 2022, which the government uh, has become frightened about because uh, the consequences have been really, really harsh. Um, so uh, hundreds of thousands of people own properties that can't be finished by the developers because they're bust. And uh, there's a lot of debt in the sector. Recent history has seen huge real estate developers like Evergrande default. Now, people's life savings are at risk, banks are on the hook, and local governments are drowning in debt. Now, the local governments, of course, don't have means to get 
um, financing because, of course, land sales were the largest um, revenue. But what do China's debt difficulties mean for its economic trajectory? For many years, we've argued that China cannot get into crisis. You know, I mean, I've been saying this for many years that it's nearly impossible for many reasons because China is very controlled, the banks are controlled, blah, blah, blah. And kind of virtuous circle, everybody helps each other. Thus, well, the minute you start having too much debt. So then you either have to issue more debt to just to service the interest payments, um, or you have to shrink expenditure. And shrinking expenditure is very difficult in the middle of a, you know, a health crisis, basically, that's ongoing. To reduce its giant deficit, China's authorities will have to cut spending, meaning they have to veer away from the strategy that propped up its economy in the first place. This will continue to be a drag to the Chinese economy. Uh, because companies and governments, they always have to service their debt. Whatever income they make, they always have to, um, you know, pay interest, basically. Uh, and that limits the amount of investment um, and also consumption. Consumption is another cloud in China's outlook. To wean its economy off of public debt and real estate, the country needs to strengthen another economic engine, demand. Chinese consumers need to spend more, but that's not what's happening. Harsh pandemic measures suppressed consumption for the past three years, but zero COVID isn't the only reason people in China are holding on to their cash. Nowadays, China, Chinese people save up for their future um, because uh, uh, the uh, public uh, welfare scheme is still uh, not covering the entire population. China has one of the highest national savings rates in the world. Analysts agree that a big reason is a fragile social safety net. Once you retire, you don't know how, how, you, are, how you are going to sustain yourself and so on and so forth, right? And when people get sick, they do, for those people who don't necessarily have good access to um, the healthcare system, you are afraid to get sick because you cannot afford to go to see the doctor. Another reason consumers aren't driving enough growth in China is one we are already familiar with, debt. The problem for middle class is that on the one hand, they have to, they, they are suffering from this arms race of, um, you know, the competition of spending on their children, education. And then on the other hand, you also have to have a, buy a house and a housing market is it, it, for a long period of time, it's just so expensive. Houses are just so expensive in China. And uh, that contributes a lot to uh, the actually change the Chinese savers to Chinese household from savers to actually very much indebted and the mortgage suppress. Now that Beijing's zero COVID policy is winding down, many analysts say that alleviating anxieties around money is key to unlocking a new growth phase. A lot of economists, you know, including Chinese ones, even now are trying to say to the Chinese government is that they need a US style or European style fiscal stimulus, uh, which primarily benefit the households. You just transfer money to the households uh, to, you know, give them additional spending power. Uh, but up to this point, the Chinese government has refused. Driving up demand comes with a price tag the Chinese government hasn't been willing to pay so far. China has no fiscal room anymore. China's public debt is very high and it is engaging in massive increase in military expenditure. So the room for the welfare state, for, you know, for, for a kind of a, a, you know, room for consumption, which is another important factor to support consumption, um, isn't really there. And China is contending with another internal problem, demographic change. China is the fastest aging country on earth. Um, not the oldest, which is Japan, um, but it's aging faster than almost any other country. New births in China have fallen to record lows. In earlier decades, women had an average of 2.7 children. In 2021, that number shrunk to 1.2. That's significantly below 2.1, the rate needed to sustain the population size of a country. 
In 2023, China's population fell for the first time in decades. The United Nations projects that China will lose its status as the world's most populous country this year. The one-child policy imposed from 1980 until 2015 is one reason behind the demographic crunch. But even though having more than one child is permitted nowadays, many young people are still rejecting the idea of having larger families or any children at all. But hey, if women get educated, women have a career, they are, their priority is not staying in the household and give birth to children. Finally, there is also the problem of raising a child is expensive. You know, raising a, there are systematic studies showing that raising a, a child in big Chinese cities are even more expensive in major cities in the West. China's population is at a turning point with profound ramifications for its future. During the period of its sharpest economic ascent, the country benefited immensely from a demographic dividend. It had a massive labor force to staff its factories. Now the picture is shifting. You know, their labor force has peaked and is going to start shrinking. Uh, it's hard to maintain dynamic growth when your labor force is shrinking. A shrinking population means there are fewer workers, and having fewer workers drives up wages. Experts warn that because of this, China will have a harder time feeding the world's appetite for cheap imports. Well, you would need to make the people who are still working more productive, or you would need to use robots, or something that is capital intensive. A growing population of older adults will also put a strain on the country's already underfunded pension system. And this means that the, the burden of dependency of older people on the falling working age population uh, is going to rise. And this is normally associated with um, a more depressing sort of growth picture. Demographic change is a long-term phenomenon, so the Chinese government still has room to respond. It has already switched to a three-child policy, which includes improved maternity benefits, cheaper education and child care. So far, it hasn't yielded strong results. The government can also potentially expand the um, or delay the retirement age instead of having people to say, hey, how about you guys just return at the, at the age of 50 or 55? You can extend that to 60, the same as a lot of Western countries. China is steering towards a demographic dilemma, but it could still take time before its shrinking population also shrinks economic growth. At least in the short run, the Chinese labor force is relatively robust. And for those people who are the, the pillar in the labor force are the you know the one child generation or you know the the uh, 80 people who were born after the after uh, you know 1980s right so these are still robust labor force they are very much skilled and they are a higher quality labor compared with the earlier generation it's not just what's happening within china's borders that's threatening economic growth the international environment that enabled its economic eruption is shifting for the last 20 to 35 years, China's increasing integration into the world's economic system and uh, to become the world's biggest export country and the center of so many very, very complex supply chains. This, is, this has really been the bread and part of the bread and butter of, um, as we say in English, of China's economic explosion. Today, as the world is facing an economic slowdown and surging inflation, demand for Chinese products has decreased. Exports of goods and services as a percentage of Chinese GDP declined from 36% in 2006 to 20% in 2021. Another important factor is that the world is facing a future defined more by separation than by integration. The external environment in China is really as bad as anybody could remember it since the era of Mao Zedong because of geopolitics, export controls, uh, decoupling, disengagement. The world's two economic superpowers are wedged in a strategic competition. That trend was further exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, which laid bare the practical cost of codependence. The United States has adopted a less friendly attitude toward China. It's worried about uh, China's rise as an authoritarian power trying to change the global order. I think Europe is worried too, but to less 
of an extent than the U.S. is. And concretely, that leads to various restrictions that the U.S. and Europe are putting on technology transfer to China, trade and investment with China. Uh, and all of that is going to slow down China's uh, development. In October of 2022, the U.S. introduced a series of sanctions and regulations. They don't just target Chinese individuals and companies, but aim to hamper an entire industry. China is the largest producer of semiconductors in the world, and they're used in many other products that the Chinese make, uh, automobiles, for example, and they are not technologically capable enough uh, to compete with the real top end of of tiny semiconductors, but they produce a huge volume of kind of middle technology semiconductors. And now the United States has put restrictions on the sale of the equipment that makes sophisticated semiconductors uh, to China. Without semiconductors, advanced semiconductors, you don't really have very much opportunity in the advanced kind of technology sector. How far economic interdependencies between the two countries will untangle is unclear. But what is certain is that the environment, which once let China flourish, is becoming more cutthroat. And it's going to delay China's technological development. It's going to make it very costly. but. Could China eventually launch its own uh, chip-making manufacturing machines and could it make its advanced chips? I think China is still on the trajectory of developing its own um, capacity, technological capacity, especially that now that um, you know a lot of China, American and Western trained uh, scientists have went back to China. In the beginning of this video, we asked whether China is still on track to becoming the world's biggest economy. The experts we spoke to described a superpower that has outgrown its economic blueprint. One of the things which I think most international kind of economic watchers agree on, actually the Chinese government I think basically agrees with this too, is that the development model which worked so well for China during the 1990s and the 2000s really isn't working for them as well anymore. So all this is to say that China can it can still grow, but the cost of growth probably is going to be higher. As an emerging economy, China's rapid rise was driven by urbanization, population growth and upgrades in manufacturing. As these economic engines slow, others need to be fueled. So it's a natural process, if I may say so, that is basically unavoidable. Again, this is like gravity. Countries, when they develop, they become, I mean, the growth of product, not the level, the level, not the level, the growth of productivity, which explains economic growth, starts to decelerate. But analysts also believe that policymakers hold the tools for a new kind of economic growth in their hands. Whether China will actually uh, come back, uh, it depends on the policies, depends on the government is providing enough support for small business, uh, whether the government is uh, uh, doing the right thing to um, uh, push for uh, technological progress in the long run, um, whether the government is uh, 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 ensuring um, the growth is sustainable, is balanced. China would benefit enormously if it could embark on policies that shifted the focus of growth away from investment in property and infrastructure and towards consumer spending and services. China's economy is at an inflection point. What that means for its path to becoming the world's biggest economy has analysts split. So. If China does not make it, that's the point, to overcome or, or, or surpass the U.S. before 2027 or 8, it will never do, in my opinion, because growth will not be strong enough. China needs to use these years to really make it by 2027, 20, 28. They might, if the U.S. gets into a very big recession, Maybe. Could China grow by number? Yes, for sure. But quality-wise, I think that there are a lot of challenges. I think it might still happen because the scale is still very big. Um, China is still the world's largest exporter, still the world, world's largest manufacturing center. 
um, and the domestic market is huge. As the country re-emerges from three years of zero COVID rule, its path to becoming the world's largest economy has become rockier. Beijing's next move could determine whether China finds a new steady course or stalls. And that wraps up this episode of Business Beyond. If you like what you see here, check out one of our other videos. A good place to start would be our episode on demographic change. Goodbye and take care. Thank you.